The TomTom satellite navigation unit drizzled in honey. A Helinox chair with crisp, fresh iceberg lettuce. High-end LED fog lights dipped in creamy milk chocolate. Climb jackets sprinkled with free-range goat's cheese. And Schubert helmets with a naturally sourced cherry on top. This isn't just any adventure bike shop. This is the adventure bike shop. The adventure bike shop. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. And welcome to Adventure Bike TV. Now, on last month's show, we said we had some very special news coming up about the format of Adventure Bike TV. A bit more on that later. But for now, as always, we will start with the bike review. Our Max Panniers include all features within the price. You don't end up paying extra for locks and handles. There are no hidden costs. Metal Mule. Engineered to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. On our ever-growing list of bikes that we want to test, there's a particular Triumph that's right up there. So we've come to Fowler's in Bristol to take it out for a spin. Today, I was riding the XE version of the Scrambler. The other is the XT. A nice and simple model range in comparison to the mind-bending complexity you find with the Tiger. So what are the differences? Well, the XC is the more off-road oriented machine and 800 quid more expensive at 12,300. For that, you get off-road pro riding mode, optimized cornering ABS, optimized cornering traction control, standard fitted heated grips and hand guards. And I'd say it's worth the money. I particularly like the off-road pro mode it turns the ABS and traction control off and uses the off-road throttle map. No fart arsing around trying to turn off the ABS and traction control manually like many other off-road bikes. The XC also has longer travel suspension on the rear and longer fork travel. And to my mind, these are all indicative of Triumph's positioning that this bike's intention is to be a true dual sport machine. So, it's not only positioning and blurb, Triumph are putting their bike specifications slap bang in the same space as their marketing blurb. Now back when we were at the bike show in February, Triumph were positioning the bike as a genuine dual sport machine. So I have two questions. Is it genuinely a dual sport machine? And as scramblers go, is it the scrambler to have? The bike is powered by the latest generation 1200cc Bonneville twin engine with a unique scrambler tune. That engine is carrying a little bit less weight and inertia. Thanks to the magnesium cam cover, revised clutch assembly, a lighter alternator and a new crankshaft. The standard exhaust system on the bike car's riding has a very non-standard rumble to it and I wouldn't be in a huge hurry to change it to something more throaty. That longer travel rear suspension is fully adjustable and has been tailor-made for the 1200 by Olins, complemented by fully adjustable long travel Showa USD forks. I've been riding the bike for a good couple of hours now, and when I first set out, I wasn't expecting to be blown away by the performance. At the end of the day, this is a scrambler, 
is 89 horsepower. If I wanted to be blown away, I'd ride something with 150 horsepower. And initially, I wasn't. It was a lot of fun, but I wasn't blown away. But over the course of the two hours, I've learned to understand this bike a bit better. And I've learned actually how much fun it is to ride. And what that is down to is the fact it may only be 89 horsepower, but that's a big 1200cc twin engine in there. And no matter what gear I'm in, I just pull away and I blast off. And that is a lot of fun. One of the many reasons why customers would buy a Scrambler is because of the emotions it creates, and most of that is down to the looks. Now for me, a Scrambler must look purposeful. It looks like it needs to do a job. And this particular model has a few accessories. It has spotlights, protector on the headlamp, and a rear rack, but despite those, it still looks purposeful. It doesn't look over-adorned. It looks like it's gonna set out and do a job. It looks like a scrambler. A discussion about the rivals to this bike becomes quite fascinating. The obvious choices are the Ducati Scramblers or the BMW R90 Scrambler. But bear in mind the positioning of the Triumph bike, you'd have to start thinking that a true dual sport Scrambler could be knocking on the doors of maybe the Africa Twin or even the Tiger 800. Sure, you may not get the same wind protection and your luggage options might be a bit more limited, but if you're after something that doesn't follow the my adventure bike needs to look like a giant enduro school of thought, then could the Triumph be a real contender? Scramblers as a whole are getting more and more attention at mid-range or in some cases very very long-range adventure bikes, so why not? Now I'm going to start my summary with just a couple of nickels, and they're very, very small nickels, and in the overall scheme of things, they wouldn't put me off the bike. The first one is the exhaust. Now, it has to be where it is and the shape it is, because that's how the scrambler looks. The second one is just the position of my feet and my legs when I'm riding off-road. It just pushes my ankles slightly further apart than feel entirely comfortable, but in the overall scheme of things, like I said, it wouldn't put me off the bike. Now at the very start, I posed two questions. The first of which is, is this genuinely a dual sport bike? And everything that I've ridden off road today, it's handled it with no trouble at all, but I haven't really been able to push it because of where we've been riding. But from everything that I've seen and read, anybody who's ridden it and really pushed it, and believe me, people have really pushed it, it handles it all really well. So I guess that's a tick in the box for dual sport. The second question I had was, is this the scrambler to have? Now I'm going to answer that question by just one other question, which is, if I wanted a scrambler in my garage, would it be this one? And the answer would be yes. Our Max Panniers include all features within the price. You don't end up paying extra for locks and handles. There are no hidden costs. Metal Mule. Engineered to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. Right at the very start of the show, I said we'd be talking to you about the changes that are coming up. 
Here is the whole of the Adventure Bike TV team to tell you all about it. Once again, Adventure Bike TV is changing. This month will be the last hour-long segment on YouTube. Listening to our viewers has shown us one main thing. And that's YouTube is a place where people go to watch short videos. Not hour-long magazine-style shows. And that is the reason why we're moving to Amazon Prime. There will be six high-end episodes a year on Amazon Prime. Released over six weeks from November 2019. The show will contain more in-depth and involved bike reviews. It will have tales from the trails. Giving you exciting motorcycle travel. And each episode will have an in-depth original feature. YouTube will still have loads of content on a more regular basis with all the content you've come to love. Like top riding tips. Meals on two wheels. Woo! Pitch up. Bike build. And top tech. Plus new bike review vlogs. And live discussions about the latest goings on in the adventure market. There will be at least one new video a week from the start of June. All easy to find so you can watch whatever interests you the most. And of course the competition will continue so you can still win loads of monthly goodies and of course that KTM 790 Adventure R. But wait, what if I don't have Amazon Prime? Never fear. If you don't have Amazon Prime, you can join our Patreon for just one pound a month and you will have access to the show as well. It's another step in the right direction to give you the Adventure Bike TV you want. Well, I've got to be entirely honest and say that the whole team at Adventure Bike TV is incredibly excited about all the changes that are coming up. And I'm sure everyone will agree that access to more content regularly can only be a good thing for our audience. Whoa, 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 Graham. Aren't you forgetting the competition, which is like the biggest competition in the adventure market in the world today? Well, at least I think it is. And that is like, if you enter, you can win at the end of the year a KTM 790 Adventure R. Pretty amazing. But not only that, you can also have the whole weekend spent with Mark Molyneux at his KTM Off-Road Riding School in Mid Wales. Pretty cool, huh? But anyway, that aside, this month you can win first prize. Let's check it out. You could win a full day with Mark Molyneux at the Sweet Lamb KTM Adventure Bike Experience. Pretty cool, huh? You'll be spending a whole day with Mark riding a KTM 790 Adventure R, improving your off-road skills and having a great time. Please note, if you are entering from outside the UK, you will have to find your own way to Sweet Lamb in Mid Wales. Second prize is the I Can, I Will Women Overlanding the World photo book. This is a coffee table book and full of inspirational women. Not only that, you will also get a bundle of adventure DVDs. And last but not least, third prize is the Petzl Head Torch 150 Lumens as well as a DVD bundle and these. Because I really like them and I just thought they were awesome. So grab a couple of quid, get online, go to www.adventurebiketv.com where you can enter the competition and see all the terms and condition. You can enter as many times as you like and every time you enter will enter you into the large end of year prize for the KTM 790 Adventure R as well as Mark Molyneux's school. So yeah, what are you guys waiting for? Get competitioning. <laughs> Now it's time for the very last episode of the current adventure of Tales from the Trails. We're an hour away from Ypres in Belgium here and don't let this idyllic surroundings fool you. Um, this whole area was a battlefield during World War One and Two, You can still find evidence of that here. So Sam, before we left on this trip, you specifically said, can this be like Top Gear? And if someone breaks down, they just get left behind. I spoke to my dad today, because uh, we were going to Ypres, um, and he said, there's a massive war memorial there, and your great-grandfather's there. Uh, you should go and have a look. So we've come to a Memorial, which is specifically for soldiers from World War I whose bodies cannot be found. 
Uh, the, the scary thing is you, you go in and there's these big arches and you think that there's just names on each side and even at that point you think that's a crazy amount of people to have died in war. And then you go up some stairs and there's just corridor after corridor of names. And it's incredible. Um, every single night uh, they do a memorial service uh, to honour everyone that died. And it's actually incredibly emotional. I found myself tearing up, if I'm honest. Um, and yeah, we found my great grandfather. So my dad sent me over some information, um, and um, my great grandfather died um, on April the 7th, 1917. He was 40. Um, and the diary entry from the uh, London Regiment, which he was a member of, for that day he says, in the trenches, the battalion carried out a minor operation, zero hour being held at 8 p.m. All objectives were gained successfully, but there was a delay o owing to the extraordinary bad state of no man's land and the ground between enemy's front and support lines. The withdrawal was carried out, to su out successfully, but very slow owing to heavy enemy barrage. A stubborn resistance was met with many of the enemy being killed. 18 prisoners were taken, several emplacements and dugouts were destroyed, and one heavy machine gun. So during that operation on April 7th, uh, my great-grandfather died. Um, and like the all the names that are on these walls, uh, his body was never found. And it's incredibly humbling and incredibly emotional to be honest. We got a text message very early this morning saying congratulations team on finishing your adventure and we were given a choice of where we wanted to complete. So we chose the Allies Memorial in Dunkirk which just seemed entirely appropriate bearing in mind the historical significance of all the places we've been visiting on our trip. Of course it was only when we got here that we realised we were finishing in France or not in Belgium but you know who cares. So uh, here's all the bits that went wrong. We have got our trusty steeds. Hello, what have we here? <laughs> Hello, what have we here? <laughs> um, but time is cracking on, it's half past four. Oh, that was actually how you were going to do yeah. it? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> no, do it the first time. <laughs> Did I present the shit out of that or what? I think we just set the tone to his, his presenting style. <laughs> Just climbed up into this tree to get shot. No idea how I'm going to get down. It's going to be painful. This is the type of person you are, Sam. Oh, it is, isn't it? I hate people who do this, but Claire will kill me if I don't. Ready? Yeah. Right, so we'll start by looking up. <laughs> Welcome to the love shack. <laughs> 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 It doesn't matter, it's the same thing. Bonne nuit is good night. Bon morning! <laughs> okay. Sorry, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> See, what's happened here is I got the guys to turn around to film, and a tiny little scooter has come, and it is trying to get past them, but because the bikes are so big, they can't. anything that we've had even got close to somewhere where you think you couldn't take a big bike. <laughs> Same thing, so if you came on, literally came on. If I didn't lose control, I just, because I'm shorter than both of you, 
when I put my foot down, there wasn't anything there, and the bike fell over. Yeah, but what, what is, to be fair, what is that, losing happens control? To, that happens to me all the time. That happens to me when I ride on the road. <laughs> I just dropped the bike. It's not coming off the bike, it's just dropping it, because I'm short. Okay. I don't take offence, it's just how I am. Do you have blisters on your ass? Yeah, but that though, in itself. Do you know what they? <laughs> do, do you know each blister has a story, and they're happy blisters. Fine, right, chaps. So, what do we think of an adventure in Belgium? It's been a revelation, to be honest. When Unexpected. We, yeah, when I found out we were doing Belgium, I kind of thought, oh, "Wow, well, great! <laughs> That's going to be interesting. <laughs> Flat country. I don't, you know, no offense to Belgium." Um, but yeah, I, I genuinely just didn't think it would be particularly interesting. It's a, it's a country I've always thought of as something you just pass through to get somewhere else that's a bit more interesting. But I've loved it. Yeah, yeah it's been amazing. Absolutely amazing. Amazing towns, amazing people, good riding, you know, which was one of the biggest surprises. You know, the different terrain. I mean, that first time when we hit the kind of the sandy patches and yeah, it was yeah. amazing. It was so much fun. And I think that's the, that's the key. It's it was fun. Mm. It wasn't technical. It wasn't overly challenging. It was just yeah. I mean, you wouldn't come and ride the Tet here looking for a technical challenge. No, you know, you you do anything. the Welsh part of the Tet or the uh, part of the Tet that's in um, Lake District or something like that. But actually, if you just want a long weekend where you get to go somewhere that feels because you're in a different country, so everything feels a bit different. Yeah. So it has a different the whole thing has a different feel to it because different architecture and things like that and. I think if you want to go away for a short period of time, do a bit of fun off road, and visit an interesting country. Yeah, yeah. And, and as as the guy we stayed with last night, Graham. Hello, Graham. Not this Graham. Uh, but he said that it's quicker to come here than it is to go back up to Scotland. Back, back up. Well, not even even to Yorkshire or somewhere like that. Yeah. yeah. It's quicker to come here. And it's steeped in history as well. I mean, it's. You know, all the kind of history from both world wars is quite incredible here. Um, I say here, but we're in Dunkirk, which is in France. <laughs> France. <Yeah. laughs> what about you, Gray? Uh, what you guys said. <laughs> nothing, nothing to add. Nothing to add. That's uh, why you're the host. <laughs> un unexpected and variety, I think, is what I would say. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think looking back, our adventure in Belgium was a complete surprise. It was not what we expected at all, and we cannot wait to start our next adventure, our next Tales from the Trail, which will start with a new show on Amazon in November. Now it's time for a break. A Helinox chair with crisp, fresh iceberg lettuce. The Adventure Bike Shop. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. Hi, my name is Gary Smith. I'm uh, proud to be one of the Metal Mule ambassadors. I've been using hard panniers and metal mule panniers for, uh, for several years now and uh, find them uh, definitely the best on the market. Um, they're strong, robust. They've saved me a number of times when I've fallen off the bike. Um, they're waterproof and easy and secure to use on a day-to-day -day basis. High-end LED fog lights dipped in creamy milk chocolate. The Adventure Bike Shop. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. Now, I have to talk about something that I am taking very, very seriously on Adventure Bike TV. 
I plan meticulously all my segments. Tom has nothing to do with it, it's all on me. And it's five days before the show goes live. Sam has not planned his segment. I have no idea what he's doing. He's leaving me in the lurch. He's letting me down. He's letting the side down. No, in fact, Sam and Tom are both letting the side down because neither of them have got it sorted out. Just get on with it, go on. Hello, internet. I think it's time for a bit of a chat. Not so long ago, Graham reviewed the Honda Africa Twin out in Africa. He reviewed both the manual and the DCT. So before we start, let's have a look at what he actually said about the DCT in particular. The DCT. So you can ride it fully automatic. You can ride it semi-automatic. So you do have some control if you want to. I think there is a place for it because there will be riders who want to ride an automatic bike. I think my wife included. However, I found it boring and everybody else who's tried it found it boring. So, there is a place for it and according to the guys at Honda, they are selling lots of them, a lot more than I thought. However, it doesn't engage. It really, really does not engage me. It doesn't excite me. It goes, and that's about all I can say about it. So, so the question is, would I have either of these two bikes in my garage? Well, the DCT is easy, not a chance. The manual, if I was gonna go on a trip that was 70% off-road, just like the bike that's built to go 70% off-road, yes, I would. As you can tell, Graham wasn't the biggest fan of the DCT. And of course, after that, you, the internet, decided to tell him that he was completely wrong. So, let's have a look at the comments. Note, never get a couple of brittle-boned, ultra-conservative geriatrics to off-road test an adventure bike. The DCT is not boring. Learn how to use it. DCT all the way. I drove both and I have a DCT with 6,000 miles. The DCT is faster, throw the gears and faster in the curves and better off-road. Honestly, hand on heart, did you really put in the effort to acclimatize to the DCT? It does have three S modes, and you didn't mention that you could turn the ABS off on the rear. Africa Twin DCT would be better in both areas. Is the video sponsored by a competitor? So many missing and even wrong informations, driving faults and wrong mode settings as possible. Very bad. That's just bad grammar. It's amazing to me the level of incompetence and basic snobbery of so many journalists. Ordered the bike as soon as possible and have taken it all over the northwest of the United States in mostly off-highway off routes. Fantastic motorcycle. DCT! It's a shame. A real shame. And not to Honda or to the Africa Twin, but to Adventure Bike TV and its audience and viewers like me that rely on a non-judgmental or biased review and this is certainly not one. DCT, another major error on your part, a completely wrong assessment, again influenced by your perspective that it doesn't work for you. DCT, all the way. I have a DCT, we didn't mention that So, as you can tell, not everyone agreed with Graham on this point. So we're here at M&P's in Swansea, and I am about to take out the Africa Twin DCT. So, let's remind ourselves of the spec. The Africa Twin has a 1000cc parallel twin cylinder engine. It's got 70 kilowatts or 94 brake horsepower, a maximum torque of 98 newton meters, and a ground clearance of 250 mil. Right, first and foremost, let's address the big white rubbery elephant in the room, and that's the tyres. We do try on Adventure Bike TV 
to, to get the bike as stock. And as stock, these are the kind of tyres that come with the bike. Unfortunately, we are not able to change these tyres, but if you've been riding off-road long enough, you can always get a feel of the bike, even with, I would call these road tyres. With most bikes, I've always needed to adjust the handlebars or added rises to them. But the Africa Twin was great straight out of the box. The engine itself had plenty of grunt, but I did find the DCT didn't do it justice when in fifth or sixth gear. If you needed to overtake, the gearbox just didn't want to knock it down to give you that extra bit of power. Also, it didn't like going into first either. The bike off-road felt planted and fun, allowing the back end to come out and play. An issue I did have with the Africa Twin in general was how high up the tanks were, which I noticed more in the slow technical parts off-road. When riding this bike off-road, I never really felt truly in control. So, I've had a little bit of time off-road with this thing. Now, it's a great bike, great engine. My biggest issue is off-road. With the DCT in particular, the problem I have, and this is just me, I'm so used to clutch control on slow, tight maneuvers. And the DCT, you're relying on that electronic gearbox and the engine to kind of figure out what you want to do. And unless it can read minds, I don't particularly think it's any good. I would like to point out at this stage, the bike looks bloody fantastic. Although the instrument cluster could be difficult to read in certain lighting, and there is a lot of information going on. I loved the punchiness of the engine. When the DCT got the gearing right, and with an engine noise like this, you always wanted to be on the throttle. Add a slip on and you'll be smiling. My other concern is that, as this is a fairly new technology, I just couldn't be comfortable with the reliability of the gearbox. So, I'm back after a day of riding the Africa Twin DCT. What did I think? It's first and foremost a fantastic bike. There's no getting away from that, it's brilliant. The DCT, it has its place, it really does. I enjoyed riding around the town on open stretches of motorway, even, even on like some fast gravel tracks or some open kind of off-road sections, it'd be perfect, it'd be brilliant. Where it does stumble, for me personally, is on slow technical trails, where I'm having to kind of rely on the engine and the electronic gearbox to figure out what gear I should be in. And having ridden a normal manual bike, and learnt clutch control all my life, it, didn't, it felt counterintuitive. I didn't feel in control. I would have loved to have proved Graham wrong, but he does make some good points about the DCT. 
The ones I don't agree with are the ones where he says the DCT makes the bike dull and boring. I don't believe that's true. I think it has its place and it works perfectly in places like town, motorway, even on long stretches of gravel or off-road. But the point is, would I have it? Unfortunately, I'm with Graham on this and I just wouldn't. I would definitely have the manual. I think it's a fantastic bike. And of course, this is purely just my opinion. So, Graham, I'm with you. So, internet, that's what I thought of the Africa Twin DCT. So, Tom, I need to do several versions of this. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, right. Um, Sam, that was absolutely fantastic, absolutely spot on. Sam, that was moving. Sam? Mm, it, it was okay. Anyway, time for under the visor. Don't ride here. Ride here. Explore new horizons with Moto Freight. Proud sponsors of Under the Visor. Hi, my name's Ian Harper. Uh, I'm a school business manager. Uh, planning to do a trip from Alaska to Argentina. And I'm Christabel Harper. Ian's wife and um, I'm also doing the trip from Alaska to Argentina and I'm soon to be a retired teacher. Right so uh, we're in, in five weeks time uh, we're jetting off to Anchorage uh, to meet our bikes that are being shipped. We're taking two CB500Xs. Uh, one uh, which is mine has been completely rally raided uh, so we'll cope with anything. Christabel's is a standard on the CB500X and we're going to see how they compare and deal with the terrain and journey that we're undertaking. Uh, well, um, way back in 2015 I got a very uh, corporate job uh, that was very demanding and I actually got attacked on a night out, on a corporate night out. I uh, got quite badly beaten up uh, with a fractured nose, dislocated shoulder, broken ribs. Uh, and uh, decided that you know life's too short to uh, put up with shit like that. So I decided that I was going to do that ultimate journey that I had been anchoring after for a number of years. Ian was going to do it by himself, but um, I got myself in on the act and yeah. I'm now joining Ian on the trip, um, which I'm really looking forward to. I've ridden a uh, bike since, I got my bike a license before my car license. So I, I've got had one since I was 18. Uh, so again, nearly nearly 40 years. Uh, Chris? I've uh, been riding for about 15 years. One day after riding Pillion for Ian for a number of years, I decided I want to learn to ride a bike. And I decided that I would do a five day course on a Monday. I went in, I was with um, two other guys, um, one 18 year old lad and a, a gentleman who'd been riding um, illegally for 30 years. And by the end of the week, I took my test and I passed. And the very next day, I bought an 8A3 Sportster. Well, what, what we, um, we don't want to do is, uh, you know, it's not a record-breaking trip we want to do. We want to take our time uh, to see as much of uh, the places uh, we're going to pass through uh, as possible. So we're planning on spending around six to seven months. Uh, so as I say, we're starting off in Alaska. Um, we're heading up to Prudhoe Bay. Uh, and then from there we're going to make our way down to Argentina, to the uh, world's end. Should we mention about the... Um, we, we actually have applied for a Guinness world record. This is pretty uh, cool, and, pretty um, cool. Uh, we found out the other day it's been accepted. Uh, so if we do the trip and we document it like Guinness people want us to do, uh, we will be uh, the uh, oldest in, in combined age married couple to travel from Alaska to Argentina. Riding on two bikes, not just the one bike. Yeah. So that will be a Guinness World Record. <laughs> so, so it's not about records apart from the <laughs> yeah, Apart from the record, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm an avid paddle boarder and I, wherever possible, uh, especially in Costa Rica, I'd love to do some paddle boarding. Um, and I'm Belize. Also, and, yeah, Belize. And I'm also um, a vegetarian. And I just can't wait to find out what sort of foods people are eating in, in South America as well. Probably vegetables and meat um, stuff. <laughs> uh, but no, we kind of want to do um, 
we do, as I said, um, we want to do the tourist a bit. We want to go whale watching. We want to go and see bears, uh, as much wildlife as possible, as much wilderness as possible, and and really, yeah, uh, the, only... this, this classic ones like Machu Picchu, uh, Patagonia, um, the hand in the desert. Um, but everybody takes a photo by. <laughs> so we've, yeah, everything. We've um, only camped twice, but we are planning on wild camping. I, I, I don't think have we camped twice. Yes, we, we camped, camped twice. at the, the Overland event last year. And we camped in Bridgend in South Wales. So we we bought a tent, got the, the top tent in the world, solo rider tent. Uh, and um, yeah, we're going to wild camp. We're going to wild camp. <laughs> Ian says months. that he, wherever we sleep, where there's near bears, he's going to put his helmet on because bears eat heads first. It's well known they attack your head first. Do you know that? It's, yeah, it's well known. Yeah. So if you're sleeping your helmet, you're not going to die in your sleep. We do this in aid of, of Mind, the mental health charity. Yeah. Uh, we have got into social media, never been on Facebook, or Facebook, sorry. Uh, but we, you know, my son has put me on Facebook now. I've been on Instagram for a number of months. I uh, absolutely adore Instagram. And I've met some very interesting people through Instagram. In fact, we became published uh, authors uh, through Instagram. Uh, we met a... Italian moto uh, 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 journalist, uh, and we've been published on their moto.it.com website. Unfortunately, it's all in Italian, so we've had to copy into Google Translate to understand what they've said. <laughs> but you wrote the original story. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you wrote the original story. So you can go, we, we actually called ourselves Twilight Motorbike Tours because uh, we're in the twilight of our years and uh, we're going to undertake as many tours as possible. The idea is Chris is retiring, I'm kind of semi retiring. Um, we're going to come back, do 12 months work in, 6 months uh, uh, travelling. Uh, so you can find us on Twilight, uh, uh, Twilight Motorbike Tours on Instagram uh, and similar on a blog that my son has been promising for 6 months to set up. And he's got 2 days before he flies to Australia, so you better set it up. <laughs> uh, yeah, just uh, from, from the mind front, uh, we have a Just Giving page. Uh, so if you, if you search for Ian Harper, uh, just giving uh, Alaska to Argentina by motorcycle, motorbike. Um, and again, any contributions would be gratefully received for a very worthy cause. Don't ride here. Ride here. Explore new horizons with Moto Freight. Proud sponsors of Under the Visor. Now it's time for InfoHub, where... Um, Claire does cooking, which apparently is the most interesting and most sought after part of the show, on a motorbike show. Hello there and welcome to Meals on Two Wheels. I'm Claire and today we're going to be cooking you mac and cheese because mac and cheese is great and I love it and well, who doesn't? Um, so the ingredients that I have with me today is just for the topping, some kind of old crusty roll that I've got here, a bit of pancetta, and then for the actual macaroni cheese itself, a ton of cheese. Probably won't use it all, but cheese. Um, butter, bit of a bit, bit of butter, some macaroni, bit of flour, milk, salt and pepper, and then a bit of water. And that is all you need for a really delicious and filling meal. So first things first, I'm gonna make my topping and then we'll crack on with making the mac and cheese. Right, so just adding in our pancetta. You can use pretty much any kind of meats for this actually. Um, it's just nice to have a nice crunchy, tasty topping. You're letting that cook down. Okay, so you can see now that these nice pancetta bits are starting to go brown, chuck in our breadcrumbs, put that in, mix it round, it's going to soak up all those lovely fats. Okay so at this stage now you are ready to tip these out and put them aside just for a little while whilst we cook our macaroni cheese. Right now for the mac and cheese. Simply mac and cheese, you start it off with a nice simple roux. Now, if you haven't made roux before, it's actually very easy. You get yourself uh, about 50 grams of um, butter. In essence, a really good knob. <laughs> good sized knob of butter. Cook it down in your pan. 
Did I hide that one? Or did, did, I didn't, did I? <laughs> there we go. So now that's kind of cooked down. Get your flour. I just got some plain flour here and add it in. Now probably for 50 grams you're going to use about two tablespoons of flour. But when you mix it together you'll see it all kind of starts clodding together. I don't know what the proper word is for it really. And it kind of makes a paste, right? And that's what you want before you start adding milk. Now for this amount, I'm going to use probably about two cups of milk. Don't add it all in at once because it will get really lumpy and it won't cook down. Gradually add more and more and more until the mix is really kind of well mixed in without being too lumpy. And this is your basic base really for a white sauce. So if you're gonna make any kind of pasta and you want like a white sauce with it, this is what you start off with and then you can add in all your extras and anything else. In this case, we're going down the cheese route. I'm gonna add some water here, probably about two cups of water and then add my pasta in. And then it will all cook together. So I'm gonna cook probably about 250 grams of pasta in this. And we're gonna let that cook down. Let the pasta absorb all of the nice sauces. I'm gonna put in some salt and pepper at this stage. Right, so we are now at the stage where the sauce is thickened really nicely. The pasta is just at the point of being al dente. And you can see there it's, it's kind of, oh, oh, it's looking good already. This is the point. We add the cheese. Now I've got some cheddar here and some red Leicester. I'm going to just chuck it in. A couple of good handfuls to begin with. Let that melt into it. Oh, and you can see, right? Now this is from the water. You can see that the, the actual sauce itself is quite glossy. And then we are done. We add our croutons and our lovely bacony pancetta bits. And voila, we have mac and cheese with croutons and pancetta. Right, let's give this a go. Mmm. really cheesy, really crunchy, and just really filling. So yeah, that's my simple mac and cheese. Like I said, you can add some additional things to it. You can add chili, a bit of paprika, some cayenne peppers, all sorts of things. If you've got some herbs, some chives would go really nicely in this as well. And yeah, make it your own. Sometimes if you make some like chili, beef chili as well, mix that in, it's to die for. And yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this and I will hopefully make you something really new, nice and tasty next time. Take it easy. Bye. This is the Ultimate Add-ons Tough Case. It's a rugged, waterproof, dustproof, and most importantly, well-designed case. The case allows full use of the phone and camera while giving maximum protection. The case closes with just a few easy slimline clips and attaches to the bike quickly and easily with the mount provided. And truth be told, there's not much else to say. It's a good case. But the key thing about this case is the amazing build quality and the quality of the materials it's made from. After testing one of these for a few weeks, Adventure Bike TV gives the Ultimate Add-ons Tough Case five stars. Welcome to the latest episode of Pitch Up. Now, we were going to do a little bit of a talk about how to use tarps when camping. However, yep. Austin Vince came along and he's like the pro at camping with tarps and he came up with this little video. So check him out and what he's got to say because he's awesome.
Hello, my name's Austin Vince, and I want to talk to you about how to put up a tarp for your motorcycling holiday, or if you're very lucky, adventure. <laughs> Now that means that in the morning when it's time to go, we simply just pull that out, bang. Now all we have to do is pin out the four corners. Let's go. The tarp is a fantastic piece of cheap, flexible, robust camping equipment. Claro. If it's raining hard and it's set up correctly, you will not get wet under here. However, if it's not raining, don't sleep under here. Sleep out here. Look at the sky and swap five star for 5,000 stars. Now, whilst um, I'm not going to shed a tear or put my head in my hands like Clarkson did at the end of the current format of his show, this is actually quite an emotional moment. It's our five-year anniversary, despite the fact we're in season six, but it is our end of our fifth-year anniversary, and it is the last time that the complete monthly show will be on YouTube. There will, of course, still be loads and loads of monthly content that everyone can access throughout the month, but it is the last time I will be hosting the show until November. So in November, we will see you on Amazon Prime. So we've come along to Fowers and Bris... Fowers, Fowers. Where, where are you going? Fowers. 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 Okay. Well, me worried I wouldn't get any outtakes. <laughs> oh, customers with fire scrambler. It's because the... Sorry. Do you know what? I, I hate you so much. I hate you so much. Get, get off, I will punch you in your face. Are we ready? Are we ready for cheese? Hubble bubble, look at that. Look at those bubbles. <laughs> Why is it I find food so entertaining? <laughs> My witchy laugh. You cheeky f***er. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah. Moo! <laughs> Hello. 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 <laughs> and donkeys go honk. <laughs> Don't! What do they do? They really? They go bray. They bray, that's it. Bray. No, they don't. They have, it doesn't even sound like a donkey. 
Yeah, but you don't say cat's meow, donkey's eel. Yeah, but meow sounds like a cat meowing. Dogs bark. Bork. Should be bork, really. Yeah. <laughs> Donkey. Bray. Oh, it could do, actually. <laughs> oh, my God. High-end LED fog lights dipped in creamy milk chocolate. The Adventure Bike Shop. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure.